Uh, science. The only profession where failure isn't just a problem, but an expectation. It's funny, I've been doing science for years, yet somehow continue to delude myself regularly into thinking that things will be easy and success will be quick. And again, this week was a stark reminder that that is utter nonsense. Though I think I maintain that facade because otherwise reality is just too depressing. But those moments when things finally work make it all eventually worth it, as was the case with our Wi-Fi camera. So, as usual, this week it was Science 1, Justin minus 3. Over the last 8 or 9 days, I've been chasing GOES 16. You saw the first part of that project last week where we built a giant 2 meter antenna for just such a purpose. The first few days of this week were spent learning how the software that is used to receive GOES images works. I learned about the demodulation process, the scripts that make it happen, how the satellite data is encoded and subsequently decoded, demuxed, and turned into beautiful images. After burning several days trying to make it work, we eventually switched to a more self-contained piece of software based on the original. While the FooLab crew were working on getting the program running, I spent my time learning about CNC milling and making some bandpass filters both for this and other projects. And by Sunday, we thought we'd had enough of the pieces working together that we could finally give the satellite a try. And right off the bat, we got a big pile of nothing. No signal coming from the satellite whatsoever. So we switched to SDR Sharp and started to try and find the satellite manually. For a moment, we think we saw the right signal. It was in the right spot, it looked right, but it was getting late, so we decided to pack it in for the night and try again the next day when we were less tired. But once we were all set up again, the signal wasn't there anymore. After many hours and several energy drinks later, we ended up calling it a night once again, but with nothing to show for our efforts. Worst of all, we'd been so focused on GOES, we didn't even think to try any radio astronomy while we were all set up. Knowing this week's video wasn't going to work and was already late, I started to think about what I could talk about, and I realized that the only successful thing from this week was the time I'd spent on the milling machine. So for this week, we'll be exploring my first CNC experiences and the cool little filters I made. But after this, I'll be taking a break from radio videos for a while, as rather than chasing the project week to week, I'm going to take my time and instead make the next part of the GOES series once we know that it works, and we'll also try some radio astronomy for real down the line. But I want to work on other things for a bit as I'm kind of burnt out on radio. Also, Newelec will be releasing a filter and amplifier combo specifically made for the GOES satellites, so I'm waiting for that to come out before we try again, and I've ordered a different antenna as a backup just in case. Over a year ago, I made a video about making custom PCB boards using UV film and etchant, and at the end, I briefly explored these weird-looking things. They're called hairpin filters, and are a special type of radio bandpass filter. They're mostly used for radio above 300 MHz, as at those wavelengths, these little strips of metal are a significant fraction of the wavelength they are designed to work at, so you can do some very interesting things with them. Hairpin filters fall into the more general category of microstrip or distributed element filters. Basically, the idea is that by carefully shaping and spacing the metal, you can tune what happens to the radio waves as they jump between the elements. The actual physics that make these work is rather complex, and the literature has lots of papers on them, but they're very math-heavy with very little in the way of nice explanations of how they work, and contain no simple recipes for making them. But the gist is that each of the little traces, in combination with their interaction with the backplate, makes them act sort of like capacitors and inductors normally used to make filters. This diagram shows some very simple structures and the circuits they're roughly equivalent to. It gives a basic idea of what I mean, but it's a very simplified view that doesn't encompass nearly all of the things that go into these filters. Honestly, I find it easier to imagine them like tuning forks. When the first starts to resonate at whatever frequency it's tuned for, it induces the same frequency resonance in the next fork, and so on. By adjusting the distance between the forks, you can adjust how wide of a section of the RF spectrum or passband that can make it through, and by adjusting the length, you can adjust the center frequency. One of the reasons I wanted to make these, rather than a filter made out of capacitors and inductors, or some other variety, was the elegance of them. I love the idea of being able to just carve the right shape into some PCB material and be able to make filters for a huge range of different frequencies. Also, it was an excuse to learn how to use the milling machine, which I have lots of other plans for. But as I mentioned, there aren't lots of great recipes. There is, however, one great paper, which I've linked to in the description, that gives ranges of values that makes it much easier to figure out the dimensions needed to make one of these. But even then, I had to guesstimate some values. But that was also how the author figured out their values, since the alternative is an absurdly expensive software to do the math for you. Last time when I made these, I made a bunch of errors, like removing the back metal since I didn't know that it was a crucial component of these filters. And due to the etching process not being perfect, some of the traces were very jagged, which makes the filter quality much lower. This time, since I had access to the CNC mill, I took a lot more time to get this right, and the results seemed to speak for themselves. Now, I'd never actually used a CNC mill before, so I was pretty daunted and didn't really know what I was doing. Challenge 1 was going to be getting the filters designed and turning that design into G-code, which tells the machine how to move and what to cut. 
Challenge two was getting things as perfect as possible with the machine itself, so that when the cutting started, it was as even as possible, or the filters would be no better than before. Both were solved with a bit of patience, and were actually much easier than I expected. Since I'm the most familiar with Photoshop, that's what I used to design my filters, so that by the end I had my filter design in white on a black background. Then I took the PNG images and opened them up in Inkscape. Using the Trace Bitmap tool, I was able to convert the image into a form that was more usable. The newly created bitmap object is on top of the original image, so by just dragging it to the side you can select the lower image. You'll notice that as I do this, the white areas are actually holes now, so that you can see the lower image as it moves. Delete the starting image and drag the bitmap back to the center. Then select it, go to Path, and select Object to Path. Then save the files as an SVG. Next we'll be using an online G-code generating tool called JS Cut, which I've linked to in the description. Load up your SVG file, and then go through and adjust all of the parameters to match the machine and the material you'll be cutting. We only want to remove a very small amount of material, about 0.25mm or less ideally, so adjust the settings accordingly. Then select the image by clicking on it, and then in the top left click Create Operation. Change the drop down menu to Pocket and adjust the depth of the cut, and then click Generate. If you go to the Simulate G-Code tab, you can check to make sure all the things look right. When that's done, just save the G-Code file. I put the file onto a flash drive and transferred it to the computer connected to the mill. Because of the milling program, I had to change the file extension from .gcode to .ngc, which was as simple as just renaming it. After opening the file, the object shows up on screen, but is usually in totally the wrong spot, but that's okay. To get things started, the machine is first homed, which makes it move to its starting position so that it has a reference point. For this particular machine, it's helpful to home it twice, especially if it had to move a very long distance the first time. I don't know why this is, but these machines can be temperamental, so I just follow the ritual instructions of the CNC gods. Once it's homed, I screwed a piece of PCB board to the bed, but the first time I did this, I didn't realize that the bed wasn't quite level and the board itself was a bit warped. What I should have done right at the beginning is to first put a piece of cardboard on the bed, lower the cutting bit until it was just barely touching, and then turn it on, and then manually cut a big square. This way, I could gauge how well things were actually leveled. If one area was too low, the cardboard just wouldn't cut in that spot, or would overcut if it was too high. I ended up having to tweak the bed height in a few spots to get things cutting well, but eventually got it looking nice. When I went to add the PCB, though, I tried cutting a test square around my piece, and again, the cut wasn't even. It was at this point that I realized that the PCB itself was warped. After putting some shims in to get things properly level and adding some more screws to hold things tight, things were cutting well enough that I was comfortable doing the touch-off and starting the program. The touch-off procedure is really simple. You just manually drive the cutter to where you want it to start from, and then click touch-off in all three directions, X, Y, and Z. As you do that, the object we loaded in earlier snaps to that location. The Z-plane is probably the most important, as I'm using an angled cutter and only want the very tip to be cutting, so lowering the cutter until it just barely touches the surface of the material is important, as once the program starts, the first steps will drive the cutter into the material. Touching off too low will overcut the material, and too high will mean it just doesn't cut. The last thing to tweak is to adjust the running speed to about 100 millimeters per minute, so that it doesn't snap the cutter by putting too much force on it. Shit. The first time I did this, I hadn't leveled things yet, so as the program ran, I started to notice that some parts of the metal weren't being removed. By the end of the program, there were a few spots left uncut, so I had to go in by hand and remove them. But this didn't leave a great finish, so the lines were a little bit wonky. By later attempts, this had been sorted out though, and the final result was awesome for the most part. To remove the newly patterned pieces from the main PCB stock, I switched out the pointy cutter head to one that's better at removing large amounts of material, and then cut a square around the pattern. All that was left to do was a bit of sanding to clean up the jagged edge left from cutting, and then it was over to the soldering station to add some SMA connectors. These filters are still just test prototypes, so I'm probably going to end up cutting a lot more of them over the next few months, and improving the measurements to adjust the response to radio frequencies. I'm still working out the software for testing them though, as the one I was trying to use refused to work properly. One of the FooLab members has some gear and software that ought to help, so testing these out will be a video in and of themselves. Once that's all sorted, you'll be seeing these in all sorts of projects in the future. And now that I'm comfortable with the milling machine, there's a bunch of other projects I want to try, including one that uses metamaterial patterns to turn regular PCB into a microwave lens. And of course, cutting gears and all sorts of odds and ends for other future projects. I find it funny, everyone is losing their minds over 3D printers, but machines like this one and other CNC devices, I feel are still super important tools, and arguably cooler since you can start with solid hunks of material and turn them into something amazing.
Additive manufacturing is neat, but subtractive manufacturing shouldn't be forgotten. Before I wrap up, I just want to go over the dimensions I used for this. In the paper, they use arbitrary units of mils, where 10 mils is approximately equal to 0.25 millimeters. The first gap between the feed line and the first hairpin is 0.25 millimeters, whereas the gap between the hairpins and the gap in the hairpins is 2 millimeters wide. I made two filters, one centered around 1420 MHz, which is near the hydrogen line, and one centered on 1680 MHz for goes. For the former, the lengths of the hairpins was 27.5 millimeters, whereas the latter, the hairpins, was 22 millimeters long. I've posted a link to both the SVG files in the description if you want to try cutting these yourself. And that's where I think I'll leave it for now. In the future, I'm going to be moving the video days from Mondays to Thursdays as it lines up better with the people I'm working around now, so expect to see more videos around this time every week. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more, be sure to subscribe and share the video, and be sure to ring that bell. Projects like this are supported by my awesome patrons, and if you'd like to help with the continued production of science projects, then consider kicking a buck or two my way. That's all for now, and I'll see you next week.